All right, welcome, welcome everybody, uh, investors. This one's uh, this one's a little different for you. This is going to be focused on um, veteran ventures, which you guys have seen in our podcast before, um, but now is an actually opportunity for you for the first time. Um, so it won't be the only time, but it is definitely the first time uh, for us as as investors as we get through this. So I'm not going to really go through too much of the introduction. You guys can go back and look at the podcast. Um, obviously, go to their website and all that stuff that you want to do there. But we really want to get into the opportunity uh, and get this in front of you. So, um, Darren, why don't you, one of you, whoever's leading it off, why don't you, why don't you get into it? All right. Well, thanks again, Stoy. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity and privilege to present Outstanding Investment. And my name is Darren Burrell, U.S. Air Force veteran and 28-year financial professional. Uh, with me today is Josh Weed, partner and also Air Force veteran. And uh, really, we're a, we're a veteran-owned growth equity investment fund pursuing outcomes and theme and spirit to a double-bottom ESG type of fund that is, you know, scaling veteran businesses with some notable differences that I think you'll see in the next few minutes. But today's basic theme is pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm presenting Veteran Ventures, who we are, why we're different, and what we do for our investors in our portfolio companies. So quick background on me. I, I have extensive experience in money management in both public and private sectors, including uh, at the Pentagon, where Josh and I served together, managing over 40 billion to, and uh, a lot of contracting and procurement actions that help bring dual use technology to the warfighter. Plus, in the private sector, I helped scale a financial firm uh, from a six to 34 million valuation. Uh, they just got acquired this year. Uh, all over the course of about three and a half years, and I raised two million in growth equity for their expansion as well. So again, 25 plus years, 28 to really in uh, deploying capital across billions, and uh, uh, both at the Pentagon, White House, some other items will come on as we continue to to go through this uh, presentation. But this fund serves an under underrepresented group, those of veterans, 30% less likely to receive venture capital even though they outperform non-veteran counterparts, as we'll see. But it's really much more than that. We're going to talk about deal flow and just some other uh, unique and outstanding opportunity to excessive returns. Let's see. So uh, as we kind of go through this again, uh, so I know you'll, you'll, you'll pepper me with questions, so, but uh, happy to uh, just continue until then. So why veteran ventures? This, this slide is kind of a, a summary of some of the key ideas behind why VDC was started, but it really comes down to two overarching advantages, and that's deals and people. Deals are really on the left side and the, P I'm sorry, on the right side and, and people are on the left. And as we work through the next several slides, you'll see that veteran leadership makes a difference. That di difference equals disruption, it equals profit, and we believe that truly that veterans make great entrepreneurs and statistics will show that out in a couple of minutes. And businesses that thrive on proactive leadership in all phases, and nowhere is it more, more, more pronounced when they're scaling uh, early on. And so as you'll see in the coming slides, the government invests billions of dollars in developing our military leadership and our LPs get to leverage that investment when they transition into the private sector as we interact exclusively with firms in leadership through our portfolio companies. But it's really not just the firms that are better that we invest in, but the people on our team, of which Josh is a part of, uh, but we've assembled a great team that I think you'll see here in the next several slides that really understands not only the private sector, but the government, the process, extensive understanding of where the future of technology and, uh, and thus resources is headed. And we harness that in our network uh, to, to really find the best deals for your investment. But now, really, that comes down to the, the second half of the slide here in deals and deal flow. Our extensive network, you know, has better access to superior deals, and you'll see some cool partnerships, processes, people, and infrastructure that are really built for these powerful opportunities. Um, and again, I'll get into a little bit more deals or uh, opportunity in the in the uh, in just in the market that we play the majority in national security and defense. But you have this great combination with. Um, deal flow, access, and then governmental incentive programs like non-dilutive uh, uh, grants and op other opportunities. And you really come up with, um, you know, just de-risking this investment for LPs and scaling at a faster pace. So again, we deploy a lot more than money. We deploy expertise, 
shared services, gaps and gap analysis and plugging those gaps and then access to just an incredible group of uh, subject matter experts. So, um, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about this, uh, about the veteran leadership. Now, we, we've constructed a white paper on our website that compared the leading characteristics of Fortune 500 leaders, and the results are really ironclad. These traits that they have are ingrained in our military at every level of leadership. And as you can see on, the, on this slide, that uh, veterans have been shown to be strong business leaders throughout history. Think about Walmart, Federal Express, U-Haul, some of the others on this slide, the list goes on and on. In fact, 50% of veterans returning home from what we'll call pre-9-11 conflict started their own businesses. And by 1980, 60% of all Fortune 500 CEOs had some level of veteran experience. And think about it now, in today's environment, today's military is even more advanced, access to greater technology, offers up highly educated individuals, and allows leaders to command thousands of people at a young age. So again, we have this, this incredible ability for veterans to just outperform. They're just not on the same page because of this number one cause of them not starting businesses today is access to capital. This 30% that you heard me talk about gap access to capital, that's one of the main reasons why VBC was formed and why we do what we do. So that's a, you know, the, even that aspect of a social impact, Veteran Fund One that we're, you know, going through today, well, it, it, it is a microcosm of the military, which embodies a lot of diversity built into it. Uh, you know, both Josh and I, we had all kinds of different leaders over us. It didn't matter if they were, you know, male, female, Latino, African American, whatever. They just asked, could you get the mission done? It's all about execution. And so that's that's what we bring to this fund as well and how we evaluate the superior leadership that veterans provide. So this uh, slide, the market opportunity, uh, largely self-explanatory, but about 80% of our portfolio is gonna be in this national security and defense space where veterans have already served on the other side, just like we have, and then they come and transition into the private side. This space is continuing to rise in valuation and outperformance doubled in valuation since 2013. And as we can all attest to in real world environment and current world events, it's gonna necessitate further allocations to this sector. So we see no reason for this trend not to continue. It's largely immune uh, to economic downturns as we look not only at the government contracting space, but those technologies that are, that are dual use in nature. So they're gonna be helping the private sector as well as public enterprise. And again, vet, veterans have a leg up in this space. They've served on both sides of the spectrum. So steady growth and less cyclicality in this space really translate to a, a large opportunity that is incentivized to those veterans that are, have already uh, demonstrated that level of competency while serving their country and are now doing those same things in the private sector. Okay, so I've talked to you a lot about the opportunity, talked to you about the you know, the history, but let's talk about our team. And again, as we go, kind of go through this, uh, um, what you see here on this slide is what I'll call the enablers. You know, the, I, I founded this in uh, about three years ago, three and a half years ago with an idea of military shark tank, you know, is essentially what we're doing, but it's a lot more than that now because of the people on this slide. You see Ken Hirsch, uh, again, he's the uh, um, president of the Bush Institute down at SMU. Um, but before that, he had a 30-year career delivering over a 30% IRR uh, when he founded NGP Partners. In the, uh, and he has that same incredible technology and expertise to help our fund as being the lead anchor and sponsor of the fund. Up in the uh, top right corner, Phyllis Newhouse. Um, she's pretty much who we want our companies to grow up to be. She's a, a female veteran and has a, a business that generates over 250 million a year in revenue, largely from government contractors. When we met over a year ago, she found out what we were doing and she said, well, that's how I've made my money and how I can help others do the same. So she's one of our investors too. Don't have to go too far in addressing General Stanley McChrystal. Um, he is of course uh, an incredible individual, both in his service to our country, as well as what he's doing right now in the private sector, numerous boards, his his own um, 
uh, McChrystal Group consulting firm generates uh, you know 30 million a year in revenue. Again, he has the the incredible expertise. Privileged to have him not only as an investor but an advisor to the fund, and that's the enabler side of it. Now, this next slide talks about uh, the actual what we'll call the execution piece. In addition to myself, these are folks that have demonstrated a level of competence and expertise in both public and private enterprise. It's incredible. I won't go into all the details, but you'll see two-time corporate venture capitalist uh, who started those funds. Uh, you'll see two PhDs. You'll see an exit of almost 800 million. And that was uh, what Josh did. And then you actually have an incredible idea of defense, IT, subject matter expertise uh, in both in as, as a tech scout for the government where they identified disruptive technology and was paid by the government, were paid by the government to bring these technologies to the forefront of the warfighter. And that's the people that are doing this right now for us and that they've been experts uh, both uh, in every area and they help us kind of really uh, put together this incredible best of, best of breed where you have distinguished military careers, seasoned financial professionals, which is gonna translate to a nice, uh, nice return. Josh, I didn't know if you wanted to go ahead and take a moment to introduce yourself and a little bit of uh, your background. Yeah, thank, thanks, Darren. Uh, yeah, I think you hit the the highlights. Uh, one of the partners at, at VVC, uh, Air Force veteran um, for 20 years and a finance professional in the private sector over the last eight to 10 years, uh, ran a company uh, called Stewart & Stevenson, which was a heavy manufacturing equipment company, distribution and manufacturing. Uh, and as Darren said, we um, we exited in 2017 through a public uh, buyout with a New York Stock Exchange listed company for about three quarters of a billion dollars. But in the process of doing that, uh, anytime you're posturing a company for sale, there are multiple M&A transactions to to prepare for that, both buy side and sell side as you're as you're uh, dressing up the company. And so did about seven M&A transactions during those years. Uh, and that's prepared me well here for the deal structuring side of uh, when we make our investments uh, into our portfolio companies. Uh, I help negotiate those terms and then uh, do portfolio company support once we've made an investment to help those companies scale. So thanks. Uh, thanks. And it's a pleasure to be here today. Great. Thanks, Josh. So uh, again, the, we've talked about the people, we've talked about the opportunity. But the network piece uh, is a unique trifecta access to deals that we think is going to or is actually playing out in a, in a dramatic way because you have these three pillars of really what the defense is trying to do to make a concerted effort to bring innovation into DOD and the federal government at large. And some of these people, some of these firms and or sorry, organizations on here, they have folks that we've worked with when we were active duty. And so we have a leg up in understanding what they're up to, being a part of that. And of course, we have lots of generals and, and colonels and people that know where the government is really going to allocate resources up to five years out in advance. And we can tailor our deal flow to really stress those areas like cyber, like space and things like that. Um, so again, this, uh, the military centric network in the, uh, in, in the really on, in the middle part here is, is something that we're very in tuned with. Um, I, uh, I run a bunker labs chapter here in Knoxville, Tennessee, where we're based. I run a, my own in residence program through bunker labs that helps scale veteran owned businesses. And we have incredible amounts of deal flow through that area as well. And not to mention some of these other areas. Uh, and then there's the private enterprises, angel groups, investment groups, conferences, and things like that, that we help, uh, put on and be a partner with that helps us really take these, uh, all three areas and finding the best deals of the elite of the elite when we're looking at veterans uh, as well. So no shortage of deals. We saw about 500 deals in the last year. And as you'll see in the next uh, couple of slides, we've made uh, currently uh, eight investments, but we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So how does our deal flow work and how does the, um, the construction of the portfolio work? So we see a lot of deals but we're looking for those companies that are de-risk uh, to a high level of degree, meaning they're post-revenue, they have this dual-use technology bent in the defense and GovCon spec, uh, sector, and they're, they're better known than led, right? And uh, our goal is to deploy 
around a million plus or minus in the first round and then reserve capital for follow on of up to $5 million. We do this by uh, looking to get about a minority stake of around 15 to 20%. So a lot of these companies will have, you know, less than 5 million in ARR, but we help to take them to that next level. Uh, we like to lead rounds, have the board seat. And again, if you do the math on this, we're looking to have between 25 and 30 companies in the portfolio. Uh, main areas that we focus on in this GovCon defense national security areas, you know, security itself, whether that's cybersecurity, data security, or physical security, logistics, uh, thinking, you know, so, um, uh, supply chain and and distribution, and then aerospace. That's what Josh and I did when we were active, and so we were able to kind of really know that space really well. Uh, and again, a lot of these, uh, the governmental contracts that we seek that we have actually been successful in, they help, you know, uh, bolster in a counter cyclical, um, you know, environment when the economic, uh, you know, the cyclicality of the business cycle. So this is, uh, you know, the risk mitigating strategies that we employ, not only is in the government contra contracting space, but also in the non dilutive space. And so what, what you'll see in uh, this next slide of our portfolio companies, these are some of the companies that we have invested in to date. Um, not all of them, uh, because some of them we're actually finalizing the deals on, but this slide represents mostly defense and commercial or in contracting space. Uh, but we'll also let you know that every one of these, not every one of these, but most of these have had some level of governmental grant, may that phase two small business innovative research grant. That's almost a million dollars in non dilutive funding that we've helped prepare for several of these companies to get. So we've leveraged our, uh, design, our ability and knowledge in helping uh, generate non dilutive funding on top of our equity investments. What does that do? That not only de risks the investment, but it also gives them runway so that our investors' dollars go further and faster. So the other thing I'll note down here is that there's a couple companies there Hero Beverage and True Made Foods which are just simply great investments. So I said 80% of our portfolio is in that defense and security space, um, but we also look for those veteran companies that are actually just um, really uh, uh, a great investment and gonna deliver a large return. The Hero Beverage is, uh, if you're familiar with Black Rifle Coffee, we believe it's the next Black Rifle Coffee in the making. Those guys had an IPO this year, and now we're, um, do, we're seeing the same level of intensity in Hero Beverage, which stands for Help Everyone Remain Operational, where they do a lot of first responder give back. Um, and they're also going to do about $3 million in revenue this year, so they're well on their way. True Made Foods, another company that did $3 million last year and looking to uh, take on the likes of Heinz and Hunts in their ketchup and other condiments. And so they are incredibly a great opportunity that looks like it could be a, a very attractive acquisition candidate here in the next 12 to 18 months. So this is just a, the sample of what we are doing in the in the GovCon space. I could tell you about the logistics drone company in Silent Arrow. We've garnered uh, over 1.5 million in non dilutive funding on top of that investment. Uh, CID real time asset management tracking technology that is about to land a seven million dollar government contract or possibly Veritex. Again, every one of these stories they're bringing us uh, blockchain supply inventory management to a 70 year old technology uh, in, the, in the Department of Defense inventory management. So there's a story with every one of these, but they have the same grit and mentality, mission focused uh, and ability to adapt and overcome to really make a difference, not only in the, um, in the public sector, but in the private sector as well. As far as the terms of the of the fund, it's very typical of a, of a venture capital fund, um, you know, a two net 20 structure and uh, basically a 10 year lifespan. We are already into year two. So we're, we're, we're looking to deliver returns as the liquid liquidation events happen, most likely in the M&A side of the house. And uh, again, you'll see the same. Uh, the, the, the main unique and distinguishing characteristics is our theme focus not the fun terms, they're pretty standard. And so that's uh, that's kind of the us in a nutshell. Um, and I hope uh, this kind of gives you a brief opportunity that uh, really, it, 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 this makes sense on a number of levels. It makes financial sense because 
as as your client base probably knows, uh, Stoy, that uh, uh, VC has out, outperformed the S&P 500 for over a decade. Uh, it makes good common sense because veterans have served on both sides of the coins and they have uh, the government invest billions of dollars in the, uh, you know, in the development of those leaders. And so we just th- see this as making sense that now is the time to really uh, to join us as an LP and uh, happy to take any questions you may have. Yeah, absolutely. Let's start with um, the defense side sector in general. Um, Obviously, <clears throat> we've seen it where obviously the, the the ability and the budget for the defense side, it's it's just ginormous, right? Um, when you guys are looking at these deals and figuring these things out, can you educate uh, investors a little more so on that defense side and why it's so big, but also so important in regards to, you know, VVC and what investments you're picking? <clears throat> sure. Um, th- you know what, uh, Josh? actually is working in the Pentagon on his reserve duty, and he act helps do the budget for the DOD. Josh, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a great question. Um, so, you know, defense budgets, as you said, are, 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 are large and growing. Uh, so the Department of Defense is the single largest customer in the world. Um, President Biden just released his fiscal 2023 budget a few weeks ago. And that was the DOD's budget is the largest in history. Um, and our fund is aligned to those priorities. So the, the good thing about our Department of Defense is uh, they publish a lot of documents about what their strategies and their objectives are. Uh, and obviously they outline their budget priorities. So when we think about the national security strategy, the national military strategy, we know where the department is going. A lot of that is, is public source material. Uh, the other aspect of our fund is because we have uh, a, a cohort of veterans, as well as uh, some pretty senior military advisors uh, that have been around both the operational side uh, of the military, as well as the what we call the planning, programming and budgeting uh, uh, aspect of, of how the DOD builds its budgets. Uh, we've been inside on that. We've been part of building those budgets in the past, so we know where priorities turn into funding. Uh, The second thing I would say is that, um, you know, DOD for the last probably five to 10 years has realized that there was a pretty heavy uh, concentration or consolidation of the defense industrial base. Uh, And that causes problems uh, as we're seeing in the rest of the world uh, currently with some of the supply chain consolidation we've seen. And so DOD made a strategic shift uh, about five to 10 years ago. Uh, that said they're going to create more innovation and invest in more in smaller companies so that there's a more diverse and robust uh, defense industrial base. Um, and a lot of the, one of the ways they're doing that is through what, what we call the defense innovation ecosystem. And so that's a combination of uh, deliberate funding, whether that's SBIR, they have new programs called tactical TACFI, uh, STRATFI, which is really um, designed to help companies, uh, innovative companies, startups um, begin and then scale to a point where they can provide technology to the defense department. There's a there's a term around the defense startup uh, universe that's called the valley of death. And essentially that is because the DOD's procurement system has a history of being so difficult to work with, a lot of innovative companies just can't survive that valley of death. And so there are a combination of programs that have been put into place to help bridge, you know, create bridge funding from seed investments in like a venture capital style investment to the point where they can become a viable company, get a government contract, become what's called a program of record uh, and, and win that government funding. And so we're, we, we leverage those programs. Uh, as Darren said, uh, we've invested in one of our companies. Um, about a half million dollars, and then we secured a 1.5 million dollars of government grants for that company. So, if you're a startup founder, you got two million bucks. A million five of that was non-dilutive, and about only about half a million dollars of that uh, was actually equity traded into the company. So, that's a really powerful tool for these startups that doesn't really exist in a pure commercial application, uh, and that's there because the Department of Defense wants to. Um, incentivize that innovation ecosystem. And then the third point I'd make is that, you know, we see there's less cyclicality in the government budgets when they make decisions, procurement decisions, those tend to stick around for a while. Uh, and so as we look at the the landscape now, 
um, there's both a fiscal need and then a, a fairly new strategic imperative for the Department of Defense to modernize and, and recapitalize its defense hardware and its infrastructure to meet the challenges of the world that we now live in, which has a few uh, near peer competitors in both uh, China and Russia. And so there will be an increasing emphasis on ensuring that we are buying the right tech and keeping our force modern. And that means that there's going to be continued uh, investment in these areas. I hope that uh, was not too long winded of an answer. Oh, no, no, no. Darren, Darren's more long winded. We, we learned that on the podcast. Um, no, it was a great answer. I, we, we were falling for sure. Uh, Darren, you had spoke about getting 500 deals across your table last year. Can you talk through how the deals got there and what your guys' vetting process looks like? Yeah, it's a great question as well. So again, we have uh, almost three different channels uh, that we get deals from. A lot of it is what Josh talked about, that defense innovation unit, unit and some of the relationships that our senior leaders have across the department. So they know the technologies, they push it towards us because they know that we have the ability to uh, deploy capital and expertise in those companies. But really that that uh, the, the group of, um, you know, what I was, me uh, talking about with bunker labs um that's a nationwide nonprofit whose sole mission is for, to help veterans and spouses start businesses and they have over nineteen thousand people as a, as part of that group and again i manage the chapter here in in knoxville but everybody knows that that is an opportunity for them to to really um be exposed to venture capital when you're starting that business i would say the majority of those are are, are too early for us but but we are able to use that network. So here's what we do, you know, out of those 500, um, quite a bit over half of those um, aren't ready for venture, but they do um, have opportunities within the angel investment community. So that third leg that we have of private enterprises that we deal with, well, we can help direct them, depending on their subject matter expertise to the right angel group, whether that's over on West Coast, East Coast, or even in the in the Midlands. When we can do that, we get them ready with the right expertise to get them ready for venture capital so they can come back to us. And so really that, that you know, the process is pretty, pretty automated up front is, you know, they come to the website, they answer a certain amount of questions on our funding portal that, that automatically creates a deal room, sends it over to the whole investment committee. And then we take a quick look and schedule them for our 30 minute pitch, much like I'm doing with you today. And so that's the, you know, the upfront process um, and a large portion of them don't make it to that investment piece because they may not be, uh, you know, a good fit for us up front. Maybe they're not, um, maybe they're too much in the retail sector or something like that, or maybe they're pre-revenue. And again, that's a great opportunity for someone later on and maybe us later on down the line. But that's how, I mean, so the deals come with us in so many different fashions and the VC community for veterans is very small. You know, there's there's probably, you know, less than 10 funds in the nation that are doing what we're doing uh, and no, nobody's doing it in the exact same way that we are. So that means that we talk a lot, we share deals, we co-invest um, and, and that again, lends itself to building up the greater uh, uh, financial ecosystem, specifically dealing with veteran entrepreneurs. Did that answer the question? Absolutely, absolutely did. Um, as an investor, what what can I expect uh, from VVC in terms of obviously we've we talked a little bit about returns, holding period a little bit. What what can I expect from a communication standpoint and end all be all kind of liquidity? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question too. Um, I'll tell you one thing is we have an incredible service providers that help us in making sure that we are uh, good stewards of the, the money entrusted to us. Um, CARD is our, our fund administrator and fiduciary. Uh, they do quarterly reporting. Uh, it is, it is uh, ready and available to all our LPs. We do a newsletter um, also at least quarterly, sometimes more. And so we do a lot of keeping you in the loop. Uh, some of the LPs uh, are actively engaged with us in terms of mentoring some of these companies. And so there's a level of communication and transparency there. Uh, but when it comes to returns, you know, uh, the, the, uh, again, the liquidation events that occur, whether that's merger acquisition or potential, uh, but unlikely IPO, um, 
those the funds are returned as those events occur. So it's not like you know you do have a holding period of up to ten years in a fund like this. But as as uh, with most funds, we anticipate a typical total return of between three and five x of the fund. And so as that occurs, again, you get your principal back plus eighty percent of whatever the gain is. And if you put in a million, we turn that into four million, and then you get that eighty percent gain of that three million delta on top of your original investment over the course as those events occur throughout the life of the fund. And it, it, so again, very traditional in that sense. Um, and then there's uh, you know other tax incentives and things like opportunity zones and different opportunities of, to increase uh, uh, you know returns, but also try to mitigate those tax taxable uh, uh, events as well. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> timing, obviously, um, fund one's coming to an end and I'll let you speak on that. Um, but what if someone can't time this one out? Well, what, what does the future look like? Is there a fund to, what are, what are you guys looking at? Uh, yeah, great again. Uh, so I'll tell you that this fund is looking to close at the end of July. So there's plenty of time for you to get into this fund. Um, but we do anticipate. Deploying capital on an accelerated basis due to that incredible deal flow that we have. And so we could be seeing fun to as early as next year. Uh, and uh, so there's, you know, we are looking at fun two, fun three, fun four. And while technically we're an emerging manager fund, you won't find a whole lot of emerging manager first time funds that have already deployed, you know, over 30 billion in their career. So we don't, we, we, we are a unique emerging manager fund, but we are looking for some of the exit events that would help us generate that track record to increase the opportunity to double the second fund and then continue that trend in funds three and four. So that's so we're, we are looking for to deploy capital. We have plenty of time for folks to come on in. We've largely automated the uh, subscription agreement process uh, through electronic signatures and things like that. So it's a it's a really great opportunity and the timing couldn't we think is, is perfect for your group. Absolutely. And as a group, there's a couple of ways to invest. You can go direct and we'll, we'll link everyone up, obviously, uh, with Darren and whatnot. Go direct, million dollar minimum, correct, Darren? Correct. Uh, yep. Um, or we'll go the second route. We'll go through Call of Capital and we'll pool it um, and then we'll reach that million. So those will be the two avenues for everyone. As always, we can use self-directed IRAs and, and uh, all of the other funds and as assets that you guys have like we normally do. Um, but you can go direct or you can go through through call as well. Um, any other questions that you can think of, Ryan, or anything else that you two want to, uh, Josh and Darren want to say um, to, to our investors? No, not at the moment. I think asking about that minimum investment was probably the most important one that I was going to reiterate and get clarification on. So, no, uh, I, I again, um, the story, your your incredible support uh, through this whole process. Really appreciate what you're doing. Um, you're making a huge difference again across the spectrum. So we appreciate the opportunity to bring this to you and look forward to just you know the, a strategic, long-lasting relationship. We are in this uh, because of largely the you know it's all about uh, deals, but it's all about those relationships that you develop. And so what you're doing and your team, we really appreciate it. And we just, you know again. Uh, Long road ahead of us, to, uh, but uh, but a, a lot of great things that are going to happen. Josh, you got anything? No, oh, thanks for the opportunity to share this with your with your audience, and uh, nice to meet you guys. You as well. We look forward to it. Um, again, um, we appreciate everything that you're doing uh, for the veterans, and we're not veterans, but um, we respect the hell out of you, and thank you for for serving and everything that you guys are doing as well. Um, Darren will be in contact regardless of the outcome of all of this. I want to get you on a regular podcast episode because people loved you. So uh, we'll make sure we continue um, to grow each other as much as we can. Awesome. Thanks, gentlemen. Appreciate your time. Yep. Have a great day. Take care. The preceding program was sponsored by Black Mammoth. Any awards, rankings, or recognition by unaffiliated third parties or publications are in no way indicative of the advisor's future performance or any individual client's investment success. No award, ranking, or recognition should be construed as a current or past endorsement of Black Mammoth.
Information regarding specific awards, rankings, or recognitions is available on the Black Mammoth website, www.blackmammoth.com. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. Investment strategies such as asset allocation, diversification, or rebalancing do not assure or guarantee better performance and cannot eliminate the risk of investment losses. There are no guarantees that a portfolio employing these or any other strategy will outperform a portfolio that does not engage in such strategies. This broadcast should not be construed by any client or prospective client as a solicitation to affect or attempt to affect transactions and securities or the rendering of personalized investment advice due to various factors including changing market conditions. The information discussed in this broadcast may no longer be reflective of current positions or recommendations. While information presented is believed to be factual and up-to-date, Black Mammoth do not guarantee its accuracy, and it should not be regarded as a complete analysis of the subjects discussed. The tax and the state planning information discussed is general in nature and is provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as legal or tax advice. Listeners should consult an attorney or tax professional regarding their specific legal or tax situation. Past performance is not indicative of future results.